I guess we are virtually welcoming everyone from PopCon <laughs> yes. uh, to, to our panel, Black Youth Social Hacking in the Business of Digital Clout, Chicago's Drill Rap Scene and Retrospect. Uh, my name is Jabari Evans. I'm PhD candidate at Northwestern University, um, studying media technology and society. I am also a research fellow at Northwestern Center on Media and Human Development. Um, and I'm also a hip hop artist and songwriter who's performed for many years under the moniker of knowledge in an indie rap group by the name of Kids in a Hall. Uh, and so my kind of co-moderator here is Nancy Bain, uh, Dr. Nancy Bain, who was a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research uh, and also a research affiliate at MIT. Her research concerns social dynamics of new communication technologies. She is the author of a very new book, Twitter, a short biography, which she co-authored with Gene Burgess. And then most recently as well, she wrote Playing to the Crowd, Musicians, Audiences, and the Intimate Work of Connection, uh, which is actually the book that brought us together because I read that book and I was so fascinated about the ways in which she created this term relational labor. Um, but I was like, there's no hip hop in it. There's not enough hip hop in it. And uh, <laughs> more specifically, we need to be talking about like what these kids from Chicago are doing. And, and, uh, and she said, you want to do it? Uh, we'll come to Cambridge and we'll spend a summer thinking about this. So uh, my dissertation, which is kind of thinking about uh, how to kind of re reform music education in Chicago public schools by using hip hop uh, started as like a seven year journey really. And, and during that time and, and working in the schools uh, originally as a counselor and then as again, as a teaching artist, uh, I started communicating with these youth and they were, you know, talking about artists. And I'm like, all the artists they were talking about were people I had never heard of. Right. And they would show me pages of YouTube and Instagram and SoundCloud. And I was just like fascinated by the ways in which um, there were these vast networks of kids that were like communicating with each other and, and, and passing music around. And um, it was through that that I kind of felt like it was it was necessary to explore from a research standpoint. Um, and that's really where the impetus for this panel came together. And it's cool that, like, being in the industry, I kind of everybody here is my friend as well as colleagues. So um, we have Charnay Graham, who's a freelancer still, a music and culture writer uh, based in Houston. Uh, you, you've done quite, you've worked for quite a bit of uh, different uh, publications. I know you did work at with Fake Short Drive and with Billboard magazine. Are there any other um, uh, I worked places that I that I'm not mentioning? Some alternative weeklies I work for is the Shepherd Express in Milwaukee, the Houston Press here in Houston. Um, I did a few hip hop blogs, uh, Genesis magazine in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, in Pittsburgh. Well. Um, and just here and there, it's a lot. Oh, <laughs> I did a really cool podcast. <laughs> so many. Yeah. And, um, I you think, also did a really cool podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah. In 27, <laughs> that was 2017. Uh, David Drake and I teamed up to do So Many Shrimp Podcast. And that was every Sunday in David's room. We would cover... <laughs> Chicago producers in these days, and it was a really good podcast that uh, was full of great storytelling and overall Chicago music history. And we have David Drake. David Drake, aforementioned, uh, are you a journalist anymore? I would say now you're more an art no, person, right? I'm, yeah, I'm doing like label consulting stuff now. Okay. Which, but you did write credibility. several several publications, uh, you know, Pitchfork and Complex being the two that, you know, immediately come to mind for me. But, yeah, you definitely, you know, cut your teeth as, as, as a writer. But now I think you're seeing more as someone who is more a consultant 
in the space. Behind, so. I do like behind the scenes stuff now. But for, uh, for about ten or fifteen years, I was a music journalist, basically, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. part time or eventually full time. So, for moving from journalists into more those who were practitioners and artist managers, because I think both Doe and Idris. Uh, you guys both have slashes, a lot of slashes in y'all titles in terms of like, um, for Doe, Daryl Williams, you are a rapper, term manager, now entrepreneur in the cannabis industry, correct? You've right. kind of moved from, from, I met you as Big Homie Doe, a rap artist who was, you know, we've actually collaborated together and made songs together, but then you were also pushing an artist of your own by the name of King Louie, who, who eventually will become kind of one of the most influential rappers in the scene, period, drill and otherwise. Um, Grammy nominated? Yeah, Grammy nominated. Yeah. Uh, worked with Kanye West and kind of is often credited with, with creating the term drill, um, even though, and Chirac, right, too, kind of, kind of, associated with with Louis um and again you you've become now an entrepreneur in the cannabis industry Idris who I guess will affectionately call you Peter because everybody knows you as Peter Pan um Idris Abdul Wahid artist manager music executive as well as a tech investor I think you're probably most known for being manager of Chief Keith um, but you're also the co-founder of Digi Glow Studio, correct? And um, gang management, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. So those, are, yeah. Um, Digi Glow, more or less, is a um, it's our entryway into uh, into the distribution game. Uh, so it's okay. it's really a platform that consists of a combining content, music, and our game. Uh, we started getting into esports, like. Um, really tough within the last year, but Keith uh-huh. started started a gaming team like back in like 2015 or whatever, Glow Navy Gaming. So um, we just really spent like the last year, year and a half, really learning the business of esports because it's such a huge, you know, industry. And I mean, it's all synonymous, you know, with uh, with with music, and you know, it all just kind of ties in. So you know, we just wanted to find like a real, a neat, you know, an effective way to merge all of these different, uh, different avenues. So that's 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 the premise behind DigiGlow, and then uh, I have a couple of management companies. Just uh, gang management is more or less, you know, like you know, if, uh, you know, Keith and some of my other artists, uh, and then I have another uh, management company uh, where I manage uh, Bella Thorne for music uh, and a few other people. So um, yeah, that's kind of you know what 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 I've been working on, you know, lately. Uh, just doing those things while, you know, relocated here to L.A., you know, just dealing with so many different problems and issues, of course, you know, things that, you know, um, you know, we brought on ourselves. It's kind of came with, you know, with the lifestyle and with, you know, just everything that was going on. But, um, you know, it's just proven, you know, to be, you know, be, be a better, you know, move, you know, for, you know, for keys and for everybody, because it's just obviously, you know, when you got something where you try to do 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 a um, couple years ago, we tried to do a hologram show. And like the hologram, like they came and just like they, they yeah, like the police came and they just shut it all down. And uh, so you know, I mean, it's just uh, you got you got to kind of go and just you know set up shop where you know where 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 you're welcome and where you know you can just move and do what you got to do. Keith's journey from like kind of the south side to then being what in the north suburbs at like I remember hearing stories about that compound and the craziness that would sometimes occur out there. And then from there to California, I was like, I was like, it's, it felt like, (laughs) you know, almost like the same way they did Q Hefner here in Chicago, where it's like over time you realize California is where you're going to be able to kind of do all of the things that you want to do and kind of set up shop. Um, Whereas Chicago just wasn't really prepared for, you know, the, the stardom and the kind of attention that I think, um, Keith was bringing to his area, you know. No, it was, it was the crazy time, you know, just with everything. I mean, you know, and and, and first and foremost, you know, uh, anytime, you know, when I when I talk about anything regarding, you know, Keith and just that whole start of, you know, his stuff booming, I always I always start with with Louie, because if it weren't, you know, for for you know, Doe for you guys and Louie, I wouldn't have known who Keith was. You know what I mean? Like I found 
I found Keith looking at Louie videos, you know what I mean? And mm. uh, on the side, you know, where it shows the other artists, because I was living on South Beach at the time. I was doing nightlife out there. I left Chicago like two years prior. And I was just, you know, I was just living my life out there, you know, just, but, you know, music, I think is what has us all here. I mean, we all are, are you know, several of us are, you know, former artists and, you know, we have love, you know, just for the, for, for the music. So no matter what you're doing, it's always going to bring you back you know, to where you started at in some some shape or form. And uh, so at the time, you know, I was just looking at Louis videos like, damn, like Louis, you know, shit's going crazy. Like we, I've never seen anything like that just coming straight, you know, like on, on the street side, you know, mm-hmm. and course, you know, we got different artists, you know, that were, you know, in different lanes, but just from the streets to be able to amass the, uh, the level of, 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 of notoriety that they were doing was was like it was just crazy and the posters everywhere and the campaigns and you know um prior to that you know like e and lep you know they were doing that and i did some work with them you know before i i, I moved to south beach but this was just you know it's just it just it just was a little different you know what i mean in terms of just you know just had like a slightly different feel mm-hmm. to it um yeah i mean i you know I, I that's how i ran in it you know just you know knowing who keith was you know through watching you know those videos so it was all just a building point you know from mm. you know, things before you know leading up to you know the next thing and that's you know work well i mean that said i mean like i feel like just our general conversation we probably passed around a bunch of names that are familiar to us but maybe not to those who are watching this panel but like i guess i'll st- I would put this out there for everyone. Like, you know, what is this, what is kind of the drill scene? What does it actually encompass? Who are the, the names um, that folks should know, you know, at what point did these people emerge? Like how old were these people when they were kind of making their stardom happen? Uh, I think we've talked about Keith um, and we've talked about, King Louis, but like, who were some of the other folks that kind of were integral in that scene and during that time, and even producers or even folks who, who were behind the scenes? Well, one person I would say um, that probably gets little notoriety for what would be Pat, that he actually was the first person I've ever heard um, even actually say the term drill in regards to music in the music song. He had a song with um, LEP because he was doing a bunch of work with LEP at the time, so that's how I like I said, a lot of it's all relational. Me and Pac mm-hmm. in the same neighborhood, we go with LEP, Count Mooney, and E, and we would go support them at shows and video shoots and a bunch of things like that. And come to the hood with MTV and do a couple interviews and stuff like that. So it was all relational. But Pac Man was definitely one of the first people that I've heard um, even coin the term in music. Um, and then from that, it kind of took a life of its own because. People just didn't know what it meant. Like they didn't know what drill was. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people, I did a I did an interview last summer with somebody, some people from the UK, and I I was explaining to them like this was nothing that people set out. We didn't sit sit down and have a mastermind group meeting about creating a new subgenre of hip hop within the Chicago music community. Mm-hmm. It was something that happened because it was real life. It was people portraying the stories that they experienced. Stories of their friends, of their family members, their cousins, their brothers, their sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was one of the first few, few people that brought that term to light and even put it in music. And um, it just kind of adapted from a neighborhood thing. And at that time, uh, he passed, unfortunately, untimely passing was right around the time that um, Louis was beginning to get hot and just building up a lot of steam. So it was other artists in the uh, city. So they kind of associated what we took from that, from our neighborhood, what we took from our culture and our world, from our homies, from our friend Pac-Man, and we put into the music. I, can, I guess it kind of got centralized as, you know, everything with this sound, everything with this look, this feel, it's drill music. And I think it was, I think it was probably Andrew Barber that probably was the first person to be like, yeah, this is drill music. Because drill was derived from something totally different, had nothing to do with music, some that has to do with stuff being in the street, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, it kind of just took a life of its own. And, you know, whether it had been through media, music, um, videos, sound, it kind of all became cohesive. 
for those that don't know, Andrew Barber runs a very, very popular site uh, called Fake Shore Drive that many would say, I would, I would even say even when I was, you know, very active as an artist, it was like one of the first sites that I, I can think of outside of maybe Ruby Hornet, which was run by Alex Fructor, uh, the center very squarely on trying to showcase Chicago um, as a scene and kind of trying to push that narrative about kind of what artists independent and major were doing in, in, in Chicago and even those who were from Chicago who maybe had moved away. And I think for a lot of folks, you know, I, I can't speak for, for everybody on this panel, but I think Fake Shore Drive brought a lot of folks together that were from different neighborhoods, even though ironically, you know, Andrew's from Indianapolis. So it was like kind of interesting that when he came into the scene, a lot of people didn't really know who was putting the site together, what Andrew even looked like. And often he would be at shows and he would be at listening parties, just moving around as like the only white guy there. And a lot of people didn't realize he was the one who was, writing, who was, you know, he was the one actually writing all the reviews of the concerts and talking about the mixtapes and like really, really was super knowledgeable of everybody's catalog. His, if you follow him on, on Twitter, um, I think he's at Fake Short Drive on Twitter. He's really a hip hop historian. Uh, and he also now manages uh, an artist by the name of Filet, who's pretty, pretty popular in the scene right now. He signed a Def Jam. Um, now, Fake Short turned the city up, man, and just a whole, you know what I mean? Like, we had never even had the same like that. You know what I mean? Like an actual, like, there were blogs popping, but it was like, it was a Chicago thing or whatever. And I started mm -hmm. like, you know, hearing homies talk about it or whatever, like, yo, I just got on Fake Short Drive. It's like, it just came out the gate and was such a big deal. Mm. You know what I mean? How he put it together, like, people was like, yo, like, I'm on this joint. And it was like, you know, it was just like as good as being on, you know, like a complex or whatever. It was just, it was major, man. So that was, that was like a real big up for, for, for the city. David, how did, I mean, did you, when you, when you started to like really cover drill, did you, did you think about it as like almost not just you as being a journalist, but like almost being someone who was helping to kind of push these careers forward, almost like at the same time as your career was being pushed forward? I think at the time, I didn't really think of my career as pushing forward at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing it more like a passion for music at the time. Like I was, uh, I was trying to freelance full time mm -hmm. um, and that, that's difficult to do if you're writing about music. But I, I think that a lot of what I sort of saw was I was just connecting. I would watch like trends that were happening nationally and seeing how Chicago was like. I think for a lot of artists here, it felt like there was this like window of success that was way fucking far up in the sky. And like to get there, it seemed like impossible to reach it. And at the same time, uh, I was watching like how uh, you know, it, it almost felt like at the time, like media was designed to, um, it was almost like the fashion world or something where somebody in a magazine would be like, this season, everyone's going to listen to ASAP Rocky. And they're like sort of dictating how the publications would follow them. And a lot of what I sort of saw um, in my role, like covering this stuff was to not to like, become my own kind of gatekeeper. I mean, first of all, there was already someone doing a Chicago platform in Andrew Barber, but also like, I wasn't really, I, I don't, I'm not really a spotlight kind of person. And I kind of like, you know, I'm obsessed with music and interested in it, but I also don't have this like desire to be like, uh, I don't know, air traffic controller for what's cool or what's hot. I mean, I have my own taste, which I think is very cool, but, but like, it wasn't my goal to sort of lead that. I sort of felt like I was pointing to um, ways in which people could resist, like feeling like publications were dictating to them what, what was going on. That I could look on YouTube and find stuff that was more exciting creatively to me, um, critically to me, stuff that was more original and more interesting and more unique to where it was from 
than a lot of the stuff I was seeing in magazines and that you could look on YouTube and see the comments and see the conversations that people were having and see how many streams that were happening and tell that there was like a big story happening that uh, nobody was really talking about in these magazines. And that seemed bizarre to me that there would be like a 16 year old on house arrest who would have like three times as many streams as guys with major label backing. Um, and now of course all the majors play the streaming game. So those streams don't mean the same thing that they might have when a completely right. promoted artist is able to do that. But like at the time it was a very like, to me it just seemed like there's all this evidence, this story, and you don't need to believe my credibility or whatever to believe that I'm telling the truth because I can just point you to where you can find it for yourself. And you can decide like how much you want to take it seriously. Um, and it seemed like a very evident cultural story that um, if it was happening in New York or LA would have been a, or Atlanta would have been a huge story uh -huh. already. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that was sort of how I saw my role was to, and that was a lot of my coverage at the time. And um, I interviewed you actually um, for uh, spin for the piece that I did for them, but mm -hmm. I interviewed Mickey Halstead and I interviewed, like you said, like the DJs, like Amaris. And um, later on, I interviewed Victorious uh, but for the podcast, but um, Hoop Dreams later on. Like a, a lot of it to me was like trying to hear from the people that were actually like embedded in what was going on. So I interviewed in one of the first pieces I did um, and, and like get their perspectives on it um, because it didn't really seem like there was anyone else doing that work. Mm -hmm. What areas were, were, were these, you know, I mean, I kind of have a sense, you know, that the Woodlawn, like Washington Park areas um, seem to be kind of booming in terms of the proliferation of music that was coming out that was associated with drill. But like, what were some of the, the factions or some of the blocks that kind of played a, a big role in kind of the genre itself because I don't feel like I might be wrong but I feel like it's a south side thing more so than than a west side thing or if you're familiar with those who are familiar with the geography of, of Chicago but like for years there's always been this battle between south and west in terms of predominantly black neighborhoods but like what were some of the you know kind of cliques that emerged during that time I mean for us I would say Obviously, it was the east side. Uh -huh. um, but I think we uh, we just saw a lot of exactly. That's like South Shore. Yeah, like over there. You know, I think before we came up, it was bump, bump was real big at the time. Right. Us coming up. Um, so we seen that firsthand. We seen people selling this thing. It's, it's, it's being for sale. We saw him actually being out. Um, so for us, um, like David said, he interviewed me for one of his earliest pieces. I think that was the one with Keith. I took I took David to Keith's grandma's house to do a, a interview, and um, he brought his brother, two white guys, come to the South Side. <laughs> the young kids in the back, just being young kids. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I took him to do the interview, and I was explaining to him that like it was just a combination of things that we saw, things that we wanted to make happen. Like we knew nobody knew us. You know what I'm saying? Especially maybe on other sides of the town in our neighborhood. Of course, everybody knows who we is. This is where we're from. This is where we at. This is where our friends and family at. So we trying to figure out how we can reach everybody. So we just come up with little schemes. Like, you know what? We just going to give you the CD away. We're going to make it look good and give it to you. We ain't gonna, is everybody I see with CDs, they asking me to pay for that shit. And I don't even know them. So <laughs> we'll give you my CD and I'm going to be sure as shit that you're going to enjoy it because it's hot. I'm just that confident. I ain't less free. So we would go to all the L stops, all the high schools, do all this. Mm -hmm. you know, just, in my mind, shit, Bump had people selling his CDs in high school. Let's go to all the high schools. <laughs> you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, well, all the people going to be at all on the bus stop. It's hot outside. Everybody going to be standing outside waiting on the 63rd Street bus, the 79th Street bus, 71st Street bus. You know what I'm saying? And it was those small small things and gestures that we were doing and taking action on, but we didn't necessarily know what we were doing. We didn't understand it as a marketing ploy or you know what I'm saying, PR um, situations. And we just knew we wanted people to hear the music that we was working on. We paid to go to the studio, so y'all got to hear it. Mm. 
Uh, you mentioned Bump, and so, you know, just to give you even more context, Bump J is an artist from the South, South Shore area, East Side, which you mentioned, uh, who got a deal very early with, who, who did Bump sign to? Atlantic Records, I believe. <laughs> and um, I want to say he, you know, at least in my mind, you know, was seen as someone who brokered probably one of the, the best record deals a rap artist has ever gotten, you know, to never have released the debut album. Um, you know, a lot of people felt like that his, his record deal was comparable to that of 50 Cent. And I remember a lot of folks feeling like, you know, it was 50 Cent, it was Young Jeezy, and it was Bump J. And Bump J was supposed to be kind of, you know, Chicago's version of kind of that kingpin rapper. Um, and I remember one of the, the main things, because I'm from South Shore, but like, and I'm similar age to Bump, but like totally different types of, of music. But I remember one of the things about Bump's movement um, was the fact that he had this team called the Goon Squad and they encompassed like all of these different gang members from different neighborhoods and everybody kind of came together um, under the, you know, mission of kind of making him the biggest artist that they could make him, you know, and that was a lot, like kind of what Doe was saying, a lot of that was on the ground. Um, fast forward, you know, when Bump goes to prison, um, you know, technology kind of hits, right? And so, you know, we see social media kind of taking, you know, this, this really big role in youth culture in general, um, what are some ways in which, you know, anybody can answer this, that technology kind of changed the game for how you guys approach trying to like promote the music? Oh, yeah. I think that, um, like Javari said, when YouTube became the um, tool that the youth were using, it was a great marketing tool. And even, uh, don't mention before, for, High school kids, they, they're all teenagers, and that's like one of the best places to market something. And um, even going back, I knew about King Louis when I was in high school because um, they went, Doe and King Louis went to high school near mine. So I believe that they utilized YouTube organically at the time to get so many views that as years went on, it got to a point where people were paying for YouTube views. So um, I think that using the technology, not just SoundCloud, but YouTube, became something that a lot of them couldn't leave the house to you know, market things. They weren't using CDs anymore to you know, get people to buy. So it was almost like a free tool. And, YouTube was not always blocked um, on the internet in high school libraries, and that's what the youth were using. I just remember I graduated in 2006, but I remember it was a little bit of time where you would be in a media center and YouTube was used as a researching tool, but kids were, you know, listening to music, and that's how they discovered things. So it was definitely, um, we didn't have. Instagram or Facebook Live or even Twitter at the time. So that was the platform that was used the most. Yeah, I think my my honest opinion is just a situation where we use what we have. You got to think. I think the oldest somebody we were. And if we talk about that 2012, Keith obviously was what, 15, 16? Mm -hmm. um, we were like, 1920, we were just on the cusp of like adults, I guess. Um, but being in Chicago with limited resources, as far as the hip hop music is concerned, we don't have at that point um, a database of directors that we can go to. Um, at that point, you know, we just didn't have the tools, we didn't have menus, we didn't have a place where we can go to, we didn't have a label we can go to downtown. It was far in between, so when we did have access to stuff like that, we utilized it to our advantage, and I think that was a combination of um, earlier platforms. I would attest to like MySpace, you know what I'm saying? Little did we know, we were coding, doing website coding, um, personalizing our MySpace page, 
putting our songs up, putting our friends in our top eights. And that was that was a tool for me to see, like, yo, we really gained in a lot of attention. I would go check on the songs that I put up that we recently put out, and it would be like a King Louis song would have 15,000 plays in a day. And it'll be reaching, like, it'll get higher and higher and higher. And it's like, damn, like, imagine if this was on a radio. You know what I'm saying? So I just think it just, it comes with time with just us using what we had access to. That in turn turned into something that we didn't even think about, far beyond our reach, far beyond our imaginations, far beyond what we ever intended it to do. And I, I would go back to even, um, like when you guys spoke about Keith and, and the gaming thing, like that's one thing, he's always been playing games and shit like that, like Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto and a bunch of different things like that kids, that, are, that kids are into that people don't necessarily think about. You look at them, oh, it's this rap hip hop artist from Chicago, this X, Y, Z, but you don't necessarily know like the characteristics of this person like or what they do personally. Everybody don't just rap 24 hours out of the day. You know what I'm saying? Whatever someone do, they're not doing it 24 hours out of the day. They got time to do other stuff. So I think it was a combination of that ignorant knowledge that we didn't know, we wasn't aware of that we were doing, that kind of like catapulted everything. It was just right on the cusp of everything. Every time something changed, we would like, all right, well, my space not popping no more. That's how I put my videos on YouTube, how we can do videos. You know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't know how to submit a video to BET or get any type of big media um, attention like that. So using what we had. I wanted to say real quick, too, I think uh, one thing that when I think about 2012, um, and, you know, there, there's – it's no question that like the um, gang beef and stuff drove up views and all that. But I, I always try to like, I feel like people make those things synonymous, like as if they're exactly identical, the music and the, that when, when I think about 2012 and how those certain artists took off the way they did, I think for example of how D Gaines basically curated the city. Like he picked artists to work with. He didn't just like shoot anybody he was like, this is the song that we should do. He was like this. He was 23 years old at the time that Keith was 16. And when they made the don't like video, that was a 23 year old, a 19 year old producer and a 16 year old rapper. And I forget how old Reese was at the time, but not too far from that, probably 19 or so. And like the four of them made this video that like changed everything. And, and it happened I remember going out to D Gaines Facebook at the time, which was now he's never on, but like at the time, I remember he would get thousands of comments when he would post a video. And yeah. it wasn't it wasn't all gang beef stuff either. It was like people from the neighborhood who were just fans of this music yeah. and were like interested in the artists as people and like stars. And um and and D Gaines was also a producer who like made beats that helped shape the sound of it. He produced a lot of that music too. Like people didn't yes. know that not only did he shoot the video, but he produced a bunch of the music too. So he actually just saw a vision. So he was definitely an integral part in bringing artists together. Just hearing the artists or hearing the sound, like, yo, you should do this beat, you should work with this artist. So D Gaines has like outside that shaped a how million, they like subscribers on YouTube at this time, right? Like he's got like almost a half a million I want to say on YouTube in terms of his subscri sub subscribers or whatever and so his page was almost like a playlist yeah yep yeah. I mean there really were the, the videographers were the new uh, mixtape DJs like really like they were the DJ clues of, of this time D Gaines and eventually like Cole Bennett and um, uh, you know uh, Laka what's that I said, we didn't have no cameras. None of the homies had cameras. Everybody even wanted to rap or they was off <laughs> something else. So they was definitely playing the influence. You know, as people be, be more influenced by it, they hit them up. Like, no, nah, I want D Gaines to shoot my video like I shot Keith video. I want him to shoot my video like he shot this little video. You know what I'm saying? So, And when you're talking about the marketing, like the way that Gaines is an incredibly talented videographer too. There's guys who shoot street videos and there's guys that like – have an eye for it and I feel like he had an eye for it in a particular way but it, it sold me on a vision of who Chief Keith was and I'm sure Keith was also involved in like envisioning those and likewise for Louie like when you see the money dance video or uh, 
you know, videos like that. I'm, I'm trying to, I don't want to say one that wasn't a Gaines video. I don't know if I remember it. But like, it, I feel like that was a huge part of marketing on YouTube was suddenly it was affordable to create this like image that matched the reality that people were arguing about and it seemed to, to people outside. Um, I want to mention one more thing. I know we talked a lot about uh, Keith and Louie. Uh, another key part of that era were the female rappers as well, like um, Katie Got Bands and Sasha Go Hard, and they were, you know, teens as well. And I know that um, Doe worked with Katie Got Vans for a little while. Uh, I initially interviewed her in like 2013, and I thought it was important to hear her side of things because the first time uh, a lot of people saw Katie Got Vans was in another music video. Um, and she was, you know, it's a gift now. She had the gun. So everybody was like, who is this girl? Why she has this gun? Why is she so scary? So everybody was like petrified of her. So it was really cool to talk to her and, you know, hear her side of the story about certain things. And that's like one of my favorite things with interviewing some of the artists. Even though they are rapping the life that they live about, it is good to hear them as a person and tell their story without being so exploited. Um, because like I said earlier, YouTube could be a gift and a curse. Uh, Chicago violence is very awful and terrible, but you see that from ends on YouTube if you're like in the boondocks of Iowa somewhere and you just want to be on the mean streets of Chicago. So it's um real important to speak to these artists for, for me, because like I said before, that's where I'm from. So it's good to um, interview these artists and hear their stories and ask them questions that um, really reflect who they are and why they're telling these stories. So um, yeah, just wanted to talk about Sasha Go Hard and Katie Got Bands. It's a few women drill artists. Though. Dreezy. Yeah, Dreezy. I think was more of an R&B artist, but she did rap, so Dreezy and Tink were a part of that movement as well. Um, I feel like Tink and Dreezy kind of drifted over into R&B, but um, when you look at it, Dirk was more of a singer than a rapper to me. So, um, yeah, just wanted to talk about some more artists. <laughs> so I would say this, like, I, I follow David on Twitter and, and we've gotten into plenty of interactions about, like, drills, impact on culture. Um, you know, David doesn't have to necessarily lead this, but what are some of drills, like, major contributions to the culture as far as how you see it from there until now? Like, some of the things that you guys were doing is just this is what we do on our everyday now have been like embedded into like what it means to be an artist and how to promote oneself and stuff like that. So what are some of the things, even musically or sonically, some of the things that um, you feel like drill contributed to the culture in terms of innovation? I think it was just that I would say self-promoting um, would probably be one of the things I would say that was pioneered, you know, from the movement. And that just goes into a combination of things from promoting um, physically, for advertising to promoting yourself on social media, to promoting yourself through videos. Um, I, that's what I would say. Uh, I'll talk. Jabari, was the question, because I, I think my my, my drink throws up a little second, was it just regarding like what, what the differences and some some of the some of the avenues that we were using for marketing and promotion or? Well, yeah, just really like cultural innovation, because I had um it's, it's kind of it's raining over here too, so my my connection is kind of going crazy right now. But um, yeah, no, I was thinking I was talking with David on um, Twitter like this was maybe last summer, and we were talking about just some of the things that um, some of the things that you can see folks in the industry doing that like are directly correlated to this movement. You know, whether it be slang, whether it be um, you know the usage of social media, whether it be kind of attaching oneself to a videographer um, as an emerging artist, like some of these things that were being done or just even like feeling like you have to document everything. I, I remember looking on YouTube 
at like some videos of, of Keith and Reese and it's literally just them hanging out on normal. It's just <laughs> them hanging out. And yeah. like these videos had like one point something million views of them yeah. just hanging out. And I feel like this idea, this is pre Instagram. So, I mean, this is like this idea of having to share everything that you're doing um, and showing like space and place. I think some of these videos that they created showed neighborhoods of Chicago that Kanye mm -hmm. wouldn't dare go in, that Common wouldn't dare go in. Yeah. Um, that Twisted wasn't even showing, you know what I mean? So uh, I think that innovation has spilled into, into him. I mean, I think that's one example. Um, David was on Twitter giving me all these examples of like how he felt like drill influence Atlanta's scene and then, you know, and I think there's even remnants of seeing now that Brooklyn has its own drill oh, and, sure. and Brooklyn, <laughs> and Brooklyn drill is now seen as the thing, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, um, it's, it, it just, it was just the real, it was, it was that time where just like the, 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 the culture was really looking for that next phenomenon. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Everything, it kind of just, just you're like the old aesthetic of, of music from not only from how people were rapping, but you know, the, uh, the, uh, the tracks, just everything. Everyone was looking for something new. It's like how art, you know what I mean? All of a sudden, like somebody just comes with this painting or whatever that's different or this fashion, you know, this clothing, uh, the shirt or some sneakers or something. It's just like way different and everybody goes crazy over it. And the same obviously is in, as exists in music. And I think it just was all, uh, part of people wanting, you know, something new. You care less about how good the end product was. Like, if it mm. came from art, it's just going crazy. It's like that first time, man, if you ever heard Nuck If You Buck, right? And, like, man, they was just, like, young or whatever, and they was just, like, they was just going mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. They was just going crazy. So that's that, that whole time you know, represents that, man. And, it, and, it, and it's, it was amazing to see that from kids, man. You know what I mean? There's a, a book that came out very recently called uh, Ballad of the Bullet. It's written by um, a scholar by the name of Forrest Stewart, who was at the University of Chicago, and now he's at Stanford. But he he followed around like he, he has a group. I mean, he's it's anonymized, but he has this group that he's following around that he titles the corner boys. And he talks about kind of like the ways in which they use infamy to kind of get attention on the, on the internet. And me and him were talking last summer and like, you know, a lot of some of the things that he were, was talking about kind of dealt with um, two things, this idea that like, you know, like you said, quality matters, but that we got to keep putting things out. Like we can't just, you know, which is kind of going against the industry standard of that time of like find a single, promote that single. Instead, it's like, okay, so put out five mixtapes in one year. Just keep putting stuff out. Uh, I think that's something that he, he talked about, you know, drillers kind of doing. They kind of changed the game um, in terms of like the amount of music you were expected to put out to, to keep your audience. Um, I think the other thing that he kind of points to is this, this idea of clout um, where like each song is kind of like to one up a rival or something like that. Like this idea of, of clout, which, you know, I think now is like a term that's pretty pervasive in hip hop culture, but um Outside of it too, it's it's yeah. of like influencer culture, like right. big YouTube stars use it, which is wild to think about where it originated. And then like right. Big Paul is talking about clout or whatever. So what do you think? I was gonna say like, what do you all think about that? Piggybacking off of that, like, what do you think Drill's contribution to this idea of digital clout um, is? I mean, I can say one thing that I think that people never uh, sort of. There's, there's a fascination and a fetishization of this stuff by, like, and Doe and I have talked about this, like, Swedish teenagers or whatever. I'm not to blame Sweden. It's lots of countries. But, like, uh, that, like, over-obsess about this stuff. But I also think there's a degree, uh, and that's 100% true, I think there's also a degree of people, it, it feeling like when they first um, – 
when they first heard this stuff, and authenticity is like a word that needs a ton of like unpacking, but like people realizing that like at the end of the day, the structure of our society is built on on this. Like at the base of it, the stuff that they were seeing is like, oh, this is how society works. Guys chasing clout is literally ladder to Jake Paul type dudes what this society is about and the people that are at the bottom of that ladder it's like a life or death situation and like I think that the there a degree of the fascination with this stuff is fetishistic and gross and another part of it is like oh this is how society really is this is what's actually going on in this country that like people have hidden from us and like these guys are like the, the fact that clout is now a thing that some YouTube influencers use to me is just an illustration of how connected all this stuff is. That, like, the entire system that we have built our lives around is all built based on, like, a clout chase at some level. If, if it's you know, your reputation in your career path or it's, like, going down to where people are fighting, you know, uh, block to block. But, um Anyway, I forgot what the question was. It's like it's like the juxtaposition. I mean, if thinking about cloud, I mean, I think you, you make a valid point here because it's like the same way the crazy rich kids of Instagram emerge, you know, on one end of that spectrum. You know, I think I think one thing that, you know, me and Forrest were talking about when we we're talking about cloud um, where this, was this idea is like, well, like you said, this is what's happening within society, but what do you think the bottom is going to do with these tools? If the top is doing this with these tools and they're exaggerating, if you have trust fund kids exaggerating their wealth right. and presenting it in a certain way. Um, I mean, though, we did an interview and you told me that there was a point where it was like, get the biggest gun. <laughs> We're going to go in this alley <laughs> and like, it doesn't matter if it's my gun. We got to show this. Um <laughs> And, you know, and, and and when people see you in person, they're going to want the offline nature of who you are to match your online nature. Um, this is one of the things that, that you and me have talked about a lot when we were working on this together, Jabari, was how facing clout, there's like this vicious circle, right? Where on the one hand, to get the attention, you need to tell the truth about what your daily life is like, and then the Swedes, the Swedish teens think that's super awesome, and that's where your revenue is suddenly coming from, and then you're exaggerating it with the biggest guns you can find because that's what's going to make things even more viral, and then you end up in the situation that you were talking about earlier, Andrew, where where you're you might you can't. Or you were talking about dumb, or maybe it's not so good to be in front of the camera, right? Because maybe this is actually dangerous. Maybe it is life or death. So maybe you boxed yourself in and facing that clout when you're at the bottom. I, I don't know. Y'all have thoughts about that? Yeah, those are all things that you don't have thoughts about when you're on the bottom or when you're creating certain things like this. Nothing that you set out to do. You can only connect the dots when you look back. When you move forward, you, it's impossible to connect the dots. So looking back, I see a lot of things that took place and um, a lot of things that made the artists in Chicago popular. It was just a representation of real life. As I spoke to earlier, you could hear a song by an artist and you could, in that same hour, hear a crazy article about something that happened in Chicago. And it wouldn't be far-fetched for you to correlate what's going on with the music. And it's not like that for every place. It might not be like that from a, from an artist from... Sioux Falls, uh, you know what I'm saying? No artists from Iowa, Davenport, Iowa. It might not be like that everywhere or, you know what I'm saying? But a lot of other places are the same. This is one thing that we didn't think about or even necessarily think about how it would translate to people on the top. Nobody had intentions on Jake Paul adapting to slang and Beyonce saying thought in her songs and those are all terms that derived in Chicago from these young artists, from the Keeps, from the Louis, from everybody who was out and hot at the time. I remember everybody was going crazy. I think the first time people heard it was probably in like one of the Keeps songs. It was on the um, Back from the Dead mixtape. You know? If I can pivot off that real quick too, like I do think um, it's it's a little like sometimes people can overstate or like remove the agency from the artists who do resist like. I think that artists uh, 
like coming up with creative new ideas and being novel and having an audience is a lot more complicated than like the kind of like street level clout chasing. Like ultimately, if you do that kind of shit, you're only appealing to those Swedish teams. And that's like a recursive smaller circle. And like that does create like a nominal level of fame. But a lot of those guys who only chase that stuff never had careers like Keefe's or like Louis or like those guys that actually sort of achieve a level of like artistic notoriety. So like I, I get like, I feel like there's this, sociologists and i'm not speaking about uh isn't forrest right I, I don't know his work like super well so i'm not speaking about him yeah. but i would see sociologists say stuff like that and like reduce the entirety of this creative field to mm -hmm. like guys wanting to shoot each other and i feel like right. that's it's absolutely like an interlocking connected thing but it's not like the same thing uh, mm -hmm. and and i do yeah anyway yeah. that 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 is like a dynamic that affects those artists but i don't think it's like the defining the whole thing like louis career is not reduced to and keeps career or not reduced no. to the, i don't think like, nancy has all this crazy chicago stuff made any sense to you in terms of how it fits into you know this term of relational labor and even some of the things that you put in your own book and your own research or even some of the hip-hop artists you talked to that were like in your sphere, is, do some of these things connect? Well, you know, I mean, I think that one of the things that you and I talked about a lot when when you came and, and let me work on this with you was that and when I've looked at these issues of building relationships with audiences in other genres, um, there isn't the there's a tie to Chicago and to the community of Chicago, and it's coming through in all the things that you guys are talking about, too, when Bo is saying, it's relational, it's relational, I know all of you, you know, well, that kind of, we're not just, like, when I talk to electronic DJs, right, like, they'll talk about, um, it's about equality, and it's about, I'm not the center, it's about we're a community, and we're all connected to each other through this music, and I feel like what you guys are talking about is even more that that it's individuals may become celebrities, but the whole process of fostering that celebrity is really about fostering the community in a way that I think is a very real lived community that's real different from like, I'm gonna find, um, David, it's funny that you go with Swedish teens because I've done a fair amount of work on Swedish indie pop, right? and and those guys, like, they're awesome, right? But but they're kind of like, yeah, I think, you know, I really like this kind of bent three-minute pop song, and I'd like there to be more people who can join my community of people who like these bent three-minute pop songs. Isn't the internet cool? Because we can all love these bent three-minute pop songs together, right? And that's really different from, like, can I get some respect for my street, right? Can I get some respect for what I'm living? Can I... Um, can, can we work together to get us into a position where we've got something more to show for our lives than we did yesterday? You know, I think that's a really different kind of approach to audience, right? And then like, like we've been saying through this whole conversation, it kind of generalizes over time to like, I'm going to brand myself and I'm going to be on social media and I'm going to be authentic and I'm going to be available and I'm going to engage my audience and all of that. Um, so I think that that kind of practice of engaging the audience is is a norm now, but the kind of relationship with audience that's often being talked about just carries a different heft, I guess, in in the context of drill and the time in which drill is happening, right? And I kind of wonder now with like the big stars coming out of Chicago, I kind of wonder, is there still that like, we've been talking about how people are running from the label of drill because it, it doesn't carry the prestige, even as they're taking the musical innovations, and the, the, the parts of it that, that they like. And I, I kind of wonder, is there still this kind of scene in Chicago now where you have people who are, um, you know, really just getting by and using their phones and working with each other and, and are doing something? Or was this a moment that was like, 
2012 was awesome, and now I get chance. And sorry, kids. I talked. I think also like uh, Peta and Doe were talking earlier about like going to shows at the scent like this community has existed for a long time and the fact that it was this big magical moment at one point in the beginning of the decade is just an accident of timing at some level like this community is always going to renew itself and be like relevant. I know that from like an industry perspective <laughs> um, right now that there's a sense that like that big boom from starting in the early 2010s where like people start saturating the market with their videos has created this like, like the market is it's saturated. Like there's so many videos coming out on a daily basis and the president of Spotify just said to have a career now, you have to release like multiple albums a year and, and people were mad at him because it's really like he's cracking, it's an unfortunate metaphor, cracking the whip on musicians, but like, I mean, that's what he's essentially doing. I think that, like, um, that, that there's a, it's a totally different, like, dynamic environment right now because of that. Like, people are literally just flooding to get attention, and, and whoever breaks, breaks the current system in a similar way in the future is going to be doing it from the other side, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's what's going on. <laughs> It'll replace the existing model. It always happens like that. Don't try to spend your time trying to perfect it or make it better. You just create a new model to exist. Yeah. You know, it's moving to the age of information and the age of us sharing information in Jabari kind of like this. So we can share information, our experiences, and I can think back and learn from stories that I'm hearing Dre say or listening to Nay talk about how she interviewed the people. And I remember when we sat down with Nay, it's like, yeah, we come up with all this Nay. You know, that's that's thank you, cuz yeah, you know what I'm saying? And it's a sense of like family, it's a sense of reassurance. It's, it's not like we sitting down in the office on the fourth, 45th floor trying to, you know, explain a, a logical story to a media. It's like, um, I just think it just started there, honestly. But I, I honestly just want to get to a point where it's not just a conversation or it's not like a conversation of the past, but we take those elements, we take our experiences, resources, and we build something. I think one thing that I'm starting to see just for my future research is this idea that like, when I was coming up, rapping was the vehicle to get the attention because you were going to the open mic, you were going to the party and getting on the stage you were putting yourself on front street. Um, but it's seeming to me like now you could be popular without the talent, <laughs> but with the tools to still communicate to an audience. And it's kind of like we're in reality TV, um, latent society where it's kind of like my real life is good enough for you to want to know me. Um, and so some of the youth that I'm interacting with here in Chicago are like, they don't necessarily want to rap, but they might do skits. They might do like, you know, dance challenges. They might do, um, you know, they might tell jokes. And, you know, they're, they're just kind of like, I'll get the popularity. And then maybe later on, they might be like, yo, I'll make a song because I'm already popular. <laughs> and like, you know, every high school kid already know me because I'm fly and I host, host proms and I host homecomings and all of this stuff. And I'm seeing it's that. The Cardi, now, it's the Cardi B story. Like, yeah, works. I'm working with Dub Smash right now. I'm doing like some work with like Dub Smash influencers that are here in Chicago. And it's like a lot of them are just like, I'm cool. And the idea of being a big man on campus is now the campus is the entire platform is the campus, you know? Um, and so the, this idea of clout and attention, I think the tools are still there. But the willingness to put the work into the craft aspect of it, I think, is is, is starting to be lost amongst some of those, some of the younger generation. Um, I think also that, that, you know, people playing their role, you're seeing now more, you know, I, I see guys that, you know, are more willing to say, I'll be a songwriter now than before, because an industry has been developed here where people have seen folks work with Kanye and get nominated for a Grammy. And so I think folks are more willing to say, Hey, maybe my role isn't to be the rap star, right? It's to help promote my friend. that's a little more popular than me or whatever. I think it's also much easier to see like the downsides of like fame and <laughs> like, mm. like that, then everybody's like, 
oh, I got to do this every day. Like, you're like, that's not for me. It's a lot easier now. Everyone's career is being transparent. I think even when I was, you know, I'm making music at my height in like 2007, 2008. So it was kind of interesting to me that like, that's really when the iPhone comes about. But then like, you know, Double O, my partner and, and Kids in the Hall, his thing was always that like, Yo, 2012 is when the hood gets the internet, like for real. Uh, and so. <laughs> that's what <wow>. happened. <laughs>